And welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. Tech ETF sold waves of selling in 2022, but some of that has begun to reverse in 2023. The thematic tech ETFs are back. Electric vehicles, social media, robotics, artificial intelligence, fintech, even cloud computing are far outperforming the S&P in January. Let's talk to the king of thematic tech ETFs. That's what I like to call him. John Mayer is the chief investment officer for Global X ETFs. Also joining us, Kevin Simpson, the founder and chief investment officer at Capital Wealth Planning, author of Walk Toward Wealth. John, most of these thematic tech ETFs that you oversee and are so famous for, they saw big outflows in 2022. Some of that seems to be reversing, uh, certainly at least on the price side. If you look at flows here, is there any signs investors are trying to call some kind of bottom in tech in 2023? Can we divine anything out of these movements? We had a lot of bad news in 2022, yet returns were terrible. So, And there was a huge amount of tax loss selling. In 2023, money is flowing back into the market. Uh, you are, are seeing uh, thematic ETFs do rather well relative to the overall tech market. And that's because of this huge sell-off. Also, there's some tailwinds. You know, we're hearing a lot about ChatGPT, uh, the AI component. There's some tailwinds with respect to the Inflation Reduction Act and electric vehicles. So I think there's greater interest uh, because of some of the beat-down prices. Valuations are better. And you're still, still seeing some top-line growth, particularly like cybersecurity, which is actually underperforming relative to some of the other thematics in the yeah. space. We're gonna get, I'm going to talk to you about cybersecurity yeah. in a minute. Now, now, Kevin, you use ETFs in your portfolios as a, as a wealth planner. Tell us a little bit how you utilize ETFs and, and what type of ETFs do you use? Are they plain vanilla index ETFs or is there a role for the, the type of the thematic ETF that, that John manages? Well, not, 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 not to pivot too much on the introduction, but I, I actually am a manager of an ETF and I work with financial advisors like John does who use ETFs within their practice. So I'll, I'll speak from the perspective and the, and the uh the podium of, and, and represent the financial advisor because those are in, in so many ways uh, the, the clients that, that John and I call on. And the advisors that we're working with today, Bob, are absolutely looking at diverse ETF exposure and, and the thematic process is something that uh, they're really benefiting from because ETFs in general, as you've done a great job for years talking about, provide so many opportunities for financial advisors. But looking at what the performance uh, poor performance in some cases was for 2022 and how strongly these things have recovered out of the gate for 2023 is, is a hot topic of conversation, not just with financial advisors, but also with their clients. So tell me a little bit about how you, I mean, thematic tech was a really hot topic. John and I, we talked about this. I had him on all the time a, a few years ago when they were all all of the rage. As a, a guy, put on your advisor hat here, uh, is thematic tech something you advise people on? Uh, is plain vanilla a better way to go? I mean, as an advisor, how do you, you feel about this kind of subgenre? Well, I think like anything, you know, financial advisors are using diverse portfolios and building these models and building these portfolios with exchange traded funds becomes so much easier. You know, when I got into the business 30 years ago and uh, the, the concept of an ETF was, was not even uh, on our radar. I know that SPY celebrated its 30th anniversary, but it wasn't something that we had really heard about. But absolutely, over the past 10, 20 years, we, we've just seen an incredible adoption. So financial advisors are looking at ETFs for every aspect of the asset allocation model, be it thematic, innovation, core equity blue chip, which is the world in which I live in, as well as inverse ETFs to hedge the downside. And I think very attractively right now, fixed income. So it really runs the gambit. And, and what I think that you know, this conversation can really uh, help advisors think about is, is in that asset allocation model, what should they be talking about to clients? What should they be building in right now? And are innovative ETFs and thematic ETFs something that, sh that, that they should be revisiting? Yeah, you know, I have to say that the, the Jack Bogle in me, Bogle being the founder of Vanguard, yeah. um, I can hear him down up there in the heavens <coughs> saying, you know, Bob, I know you like talking about these thematic tech ETFs, but there's mean reversion in all of this stuff. Eventually, the stuff comes back 
down to earth. It goes up and it comes back down. This is why Jack was such an indexing guy. And I keep hearing that even though I talk about it because people are interested in this. People are interested in trying to buy the next winner and figure out where things are. And people are interested in tech. But you, you understand the point. Yeah. The, the, the Jack Bogle in me says we've seen these movies before. Well, you have to think about it. Thematic is innovation. Um, you think about robotics, you think about video games and cloud computing and cybersecurity. These are things that should be included in a portfolio because they're forward looking. Yeah. Next, they're, they're basically taking the view that next time is going to be different than the last. But the question is, how do you put that and contextualize that into an overall portfolio? So at Global X, I run 13 different portfolios. Several of them are asset allocation models. We put a small amount of thematic disruptors into uh, say a moderate portfolio of five or six percent allocation because you want to be exposed. You said meter reversion. Yeah, some years you're going to have great performance, some you're going to have poor, poor performance. And with an ETF, you can't, you get a collection of companies, you get 10 ETFs, like in the, the portfolio that I manage, you have 600 underlying companies. You put this into a broader portfolio, you add a little bit of risk, but you're also providing that exposure for when say right now we're talking about chat gpt where robotics and artificial intelligence are playing out yeah so john, I, john I, do you do this too i mean he's excuse me kevin uh, john runs model portfolios out there he's got a thematic etf model portfolio there's i think 10 etfs in him eight of them are yeah. are yours and they're available on different kinds of platforms is that kind of where this industry is going sort of figuring out off the shelf solutions to these kinds of things. You want, a, you want a thematic tech? Okay, here's a broad you know, bunch of thematic tech. You can buy it a single product off a different platform, Merrill Lynch, for example, or something like that. Well, I think anytime you can get uh, some of the heavy lifting done for you, you know, it helps financial advisors focus on what is so important to them, which is serving the client. Financial planning is a lot more than just uh, ma making investment decisions. In my world, I, I, like you've got John Bogle, uh, uh, you know, I, I kneel at the altar of Benjamin Graham. So we, we invest in 25 to 30 stocks. Some people say you have a concentrated portfolio. I would argue, as he did, that that's, you know, well diversified and, and you know, getting too far away from that, you start to see over diversification. But at the same time, the, the financial advisor who's able to utilize these, these thematical ETFs as a portion, and it sounded like John's explanation, some of these represent a smaller piece of the puzzle, which is, which is, probably extremely appropriate. So where, where I might live in a very boring world of, uh, of, of, of blue chip dividend growth, I know for a fact that all the financial advisors that we're lucky enough to work with don't have every penny of their asset allocation with just our one style box. So moving in the direction of, of Global X and what John's doing with building models of ETFs, I think is absolutely where the industry continues to trend. And, and sometimes we're lucky enough to be part of some of those models. and. Uh, it, it, it's really neat to see how asset allocators and, and um, other financial advisors who may be b building these models themselves are, are utilizing the different portfolios, whether they're innovation strategies, whether covered call strategies, or whether they're passive index based. I, I think it's uh, the, next, the next generation of ETF investing is, is absolutely asset allocation and model driven. Yeah, watching the development of model portfolios is really uh, wonderful to see. I, you mentioned ChatGPT. I'm going to go down this rabbit hole with you because I just find this endlessly fascinating. I've been playing with this since it came out in November. Um, you, you've got a couple of ETFs that interact with the AI theme. Yeah. Uh, the cloud computing ETF. Uh, there's the robotics AI ETF as well. Um, I'm wondering if we, we've been talking about, the software as a service been around for 20 years. AI as a service, this concept, of being able to set up an AI system or an AI piece of your technology and then charge a subscription for it after you have you know, sure. essentially subscribed to it for chat GPT. This has been talked about for years. Is it actually now becoming feasible? Can we have companies that will utilize chat GPT or something like that as part of it? its service and, and charge a subscription, can make money off it? The quick answer is yes. So think about Chat ChatGPT came out, was launched by OpenSI uh, SI in um, November. In five days, there were a million subscribers. And they, that that's with no advertising. Uh, my son tried to sign up yesterday. He couldn't get in. He's on a waiting list. So as if you actually look at the interface in the playground, it's, it's very innovative. Uh, it, you, you, 
type in an ETF versus a mutual fund, it gives you a very cogent answer. If you think about how this is going to be used, it could be basis for papers. We can't quantify how good that information is because it's scraped from the, world, the, the web. But I do think this is like the very beginning yeah. of the services and it's going to be, you think about Microsoft is investing billions of dollars into this. They're not doing this out of the good of their heart. Right. It's going to be integrated into what they do. The question is, can you get a significant revenue stream, stream from another company by licensing this? That's what I'm not sure of. It seems like you could. The, uh, playing with this for the last uh, six or eight weeks, this, it seems very obvious to me, there's going to be some stories down the road about people doing stupid things. <laughs> so I, I, I asked it simple things like, g give me an itinerary of going to, you know, uh, northern Italy, and it makes suggestions. It's it's already suggested hotels that are not there anymore. Just don't so put this your seems tax return. A lot of crazy. Well, that's what I'm thinking of. Like, what? Are, I'll bet you there are crazy people who submit their tax returns and say, "Could you <laughs> organize this more efficiently? Can you get me more tax deductions?" And they, of course, this is all kept, right? This is all stored. So people submitting private information on their personal life, their tax returns, all of this is stored, right? There's got to be a story down the road about this. <laughs> you know, John Smith submitted his tax returns to ChatGPT and said, could you get me more deductions? And, and now they have all of his tax returns, essentially. There's no question. People are going to put information in there. There's malware already being created because of the inputs in ChatGPT. That's why you need cybersecurity. And that's going to be an area that's going to continue. I mean, that's a recurring revenue stream in cybersecurity. Has underperformed this year relative to some of the other themes. Why but is that? Why? Why have I, I look at some of these cybersecurity stocks and they're not doing that well this year. And that, this is the one cybersecurity ETF bug is underperforming the S&P. It's the only thing in your portfolio here that's kind of underperforming. Yeah, and it's a top hole. You're seeing revenue growth, top line revenue growth being very strong. In the third quarter, you saw a private equity. Act Activity slow in the fourth quarter it started to. But pick why up. is cybersecurity stocks underperforming everything? I mean, electric vehicles are up 18 percent. Cybersecurity is up four percent. You know, we believe we're you were in a in somewhat of an economic slowdown. You know, where can companies save some money? Think about it. You have you have gates, you have sentry guards, you have weaponry, you have moats and alligators. What can you st and what are they doing now? They're, they're just having a man with a whistle. As soon as they're a cyber attack. All of these these um, needed expenses are going to continue, and you're going to see more spending. So, is Chat GPT going to be a new uh, sub industry for cloud computing? Essentially, I mean, it, is, is that literally does it have that potential? I'm trying to figure out who's going to make any money off of this. A lot of data is going to the cloud. It can't all be stored locally. So, of course, there's going to be a lot of cloud uh, services that are going to be required. Another recurring revenue stream. So, I do think that uh, when other companies like Amazon um, like Apple uh, and Google, of course, they are going to create their own bubbles of, of AI, and certainly they're going to need, need more services. Kevin, you have any thoughts on this? I mean, what seems rather obvious to me is um, uh, AI services uh, replacing TV reporters. <laughs> we already have some basic services. You know, I don't know if you've noticed this, but AP already has a service that will take basic economic data and it's an AI that will turn it yep. into a two, two paragraphs, and it's actually pretty good. I mean, it's as good as I would have if you only have two paragraphs and say what you have to say. It, it does as well as I would do, actually. And it, it's an, it doesn't have deep analysis, but it doesn't. And it, what about replacing financial advisors in the, in the future? You already have rudimentary programs that, that do that, Kevin. Any, any thoughts here? None of the um, paragraphs that I've seen, Bob, have come close to your work, so I think we've got a long way to go <laughs> yeah. before we need to worry right. about it. I'll, so I'll say that in the, in the next contract negotiation. <laughs> make sure we make that clear. <laughs> Thank you. Number Kevin. two, uh, from an active management standpoint, you know, I'm not convinced that we're going to be put out of business tomorrow either. Uh, from an index-based um, analysis, I'm, I'm sure they can do a really good job. You talked about how the story ends, and and you know we know how it ends. We've all seen the Terminator, so I would be very reluctant to be putting too much of my personal information anywhere. You know, we've been taught that for for so long that with this new and fun technology. It, it, to, to John's point, it's just a, it, it's ripe for hackers and pirates and thieves. So I would be extra careful. Now, from an investment thesis, we own Microsoft in our exchange traded fund. In Devo, we own a 5% position in Microsoft. As John mentioned, they've allocated a tremendous amount of money towards this uh, technology. So we're paying attention to see how they can monetize it. 
We also own Apple, which I know is, uh, as with Amazon and Google, kind of working in that same cloud space to build their own uh, islands of this technology. So, uh, you know, how, how do you make money on a neat thing is, is always a, uh, a great question mark. But, but for us, we're, we're going to focus very heavily on these companies that are really producing revenue and maybe not the ones that are the exploratory, hoping to be the next Microsoft. We're going to stick with Microsoft. I'm going to, I want to move on and talk to you about Devo in a minute, but I just want to finish my final point about ChatGPT, and, and that's the sort of other downside to this. Uh, it creates an environment for individuals to create malicious software with very little coding skills at all. You could essentially tell it what to do. I, I would think the cybersecurity threats would actually increase uh, under this, um, under ChatGPT. Um, and yet, as we mentioned, the cybersecurity stocks are underperforming this year. Maybe that has nothing to do with chat GPT, but you, want, you get my point here. Yeah. I mean, you can create malicious code now out of this thing, and it's a, surprising, I bet, how buggy some of the software is that you can find exploit. Yeah, I'm, sure, exploit I'm sure it's already being created. Um, and I don't know if they're necessarily tied. I think that cybersecurity was kind of, you know, with the beginning of the, the Ukraine war, which is about a year ago, cybersecurity did very well. And then it kind of fell off the radar. Uh, as soon as there's a big cyber attack, I do believe that companies will continue to spend. You know, we are going into a weakening economy. Um, I do think companies are trying to preserve uh, capital where possible, but they're going to have to spend where necessary. And as soon as you see that attack, as soon as you see the threats to continue, spending will continue, I have no doubt. It's a longer term play. We always say themes take five to 10 years to play out. And I expect that to happen. Yeah. Kevin, I want to go back to your point earlier, a slightly a bit of a left turn here, but you run the Amplify Enhanced Dividend e uh, Income ETF, D-I-V-O, DIVO is the symbol. Uh, so this is actively managed. We've talked about these kinds of actively managed ETFs last year a lot. They, they provide income. You, you select stocks from the S&P 500 index, and then you overlay it with a, a call writing strategy, essentially collect income. Uh, this was a big uh, hit in 2022. You outperformed the market, and other, uh, others of these covered call strategies outperformed as well. Um, how do you feel about it in 2023? I mean, the obvious point here is if the market keeps rising, you give up upside uh, at, at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we run a, a very conservative covered call strategy. It complements um, the, the, the covered call strategy that John and his firm uh, manage as well. I think there are really a lot of synergies between the two. You know, I, I've been doing this for a really long time. So to me, it's not a question of because something worked last year, there's going to be a different theme next year. We're, we're not really expecting there to be a whole lot different economic outlook in 2023 as we saw in 2022. You guys had a great discussion at the start of the show talking about the enthusiasm here out of the gate in January, repositioning, window dressing, technical trading, getting some positions back on that were sold for tax loss purposes. Maybe some of these things were, were grossly oversold last year. But from our lens, it's not a story of year to year or what's really happening over the short term of the economic cycle, but just really investing in blue chip companies, paying dividends. And that's where you get most of your return. I mean, you had a statistic that you put out a week and a half ago. I even used it in some of my, my commentary because it was so powerful. Looking at the S&P 500 from 1926 until today and that, and that revision to the mean, if you're getting a 10.2% return on the S&P 500, and to John's point, some years it might be up 30, some years it might be down 30, but that's, the, that's what we're all in this for. If we can get a good solid double digit return. But what was most fascinating about your piece was that 39% of that total return, almost 40% came from dividends and distributions reinvested. So if we can generate dividends and option premiums for clients, we've done half the heavy lifting. Whether we get a soft landing or a hard landing or we go into a recession or not, we, we own companies that have EBITDA. We look for low multiples. We want cash on cash to shareholders. And we want those dividends to be increasing every year. Because if you give me a raise on my dividend, that's a hedge against inflation. So, so I don't look at this as something that worked last year but won't work this year. Just like you, you with Bogle and my, myself with Benjamin Graham, you know, th these things work. For, for decades, and, and that's why you know, we're so passionate about how we are active managers, especially in the absence of the zero interest rate environment. Yeah, uh, and uh, do you want to say something? Yeah, to Kevin's point, these uh, covered call funds, um, they're consistent. They provide high, uh, high dividends. Investors like them. They don't typically sell them easily. We don't see meaningful outflows, even last year. Um, so 
the investor sticks around because of the dividend. You may not get the full upside, but say if it's on the NASDAQ, you got a very high 10 plus yield, um, a little bit less on the S&P 500 or, or small caps, but it's consistent and people like yeah. consistency of the dividends. Yeah, and good point. Uh, and so, uh, those of you who don't know what Kevin was referring to, I did a story a couple of weeks ago about total returns on the S&P 500 since the 1920s. And if you look at total returns, which is price plus the dividend, 39% of the total return was provided by dividends, providing they were reinvested. And what happens in reinvesting the dividends is you harness the power of compounding interest, which if I, when I talk to students who come down here, high school students, I say, if there's one thing you got to understand, it's the beauty and the power of compounding interest. There really is a big difference between 1% and 2% returns a year over decades. And the numbers get very large. Not, they get, don't look like much in the beginning, but over decades, they look really, really large. Kevin, I wonder if you could just give us your thoughts on the stock market right now. Um, there's a lot of debate about we've had a nice rally, and yet the market's trading at 17 and a half, almost 18 times forward earnings. That's a, traditionally a fairly high multiple, certainly not a recession multiple at all. Um, your thoughts on the market right now? Well, I, I, I tend to be a little bit more... Um pessimistic as I'm looking out over the landscape after what we've seen in January. To your point, multiples are a little bit higher than maybe they deserve to be, considering the fact that the Fed's not done raising interest rates yet. Now, every time you see another interest rate hike, it puts compression on multiples. So that's a problem. As far as earnings are concerned, you know, I don't know that we've seen every one of these interest rate hikes really priced into earnings. Earnings season has been better than feared. But when can't we say that? I mean, most of the time, we set the bar so low that we can come out and beat it. So I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that we might be a little bit more optimistic on earnings and a little bit more inflated on multiples. So when you project out at the end of the year, it's almost like I feel the market's trading where it should be in December of 2023, not necessarily in January. So we're probably in store for some volatility, a range-bound market. And, and the thing that could change that, the thing that could be the start of the next bull market and, and really thrust it forward would be the Fed decreasing interest rates, would be that actual pivot. Markets will get excited when there's a pause, but a pause isn't a pivot. When they start lowering rates, that's when yeah. the market takes off. And I, I'm just not sure I see that in this calendar year. Well, there's certainly not this week. I can guarantee you uh, that Jay Powell is not going to say, hi, folks, we have won against <laughs> inflation. And by the way, you can look forward to us reducing rates later in the year. Guarantee you he's not going to say that. So what is he going to say this week? Well, he's going to raise 25 basis points, and he's going to say that there's still inflation in certain portions of the market, uh, wage growth. Um, there's less good spending, but more service spending. So inflation, you know, we're in a, if we hit a recession, it'll be a, 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 a shallow recession from my perspective. But this is a very unique situation because we're coming out of this pandemic. I do expect that we'll experience volatility around the debt ceiling. Um, that's going to be an issue, and that's probably an opportunity to buy the market when it goes down, because it's certainly going to be a discussion point um, you know, a few months down the line. Um, I do think the market looks out about four quarters. Um, a lot of this negative information is in the market. Uh, interest rates are going to stay elevated for a period of time because they have to bring inflation down. Doesn't mean there's not pockets of opportunity. I do agree with Kevin. This is probably a range-bound market. Covered calls is probably a good place to be in that market. Okay. We've covered a lot here today, folks. Thematic tech and dividends and market prognostications. That's what we do here every week, bringing you more interesting news on the ETF market and everything around it. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. My thanks to John and Kevin. And remember, you can see all of our shows on our website. That's etfedge.cnbc.com. And you can hear the show on our podcast as well. Now, next week, I'll be at the ETF Exchange Conference in Miami Beach, Florida. I'll be talking with the cream of the crop of the ETF industry as they gather for the largest ETF conference in the world. Stay tuned. For that, everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week.